The last person I saw before I got wheeled into this operating room that looked like a spaceship uh, was my dad. You know, he said, it's just you and your surgeon and your maker now. And I love you. And I love you. And I love you. And um, that day was the darkest day in my life. My life. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of More Than A Sale, where it's not just about the successes, it's about the failures, the heartbreaks, the setbacks, to get to where you are today. And today I have... Ravi Singh. Ravi Singh. Ravi Singh. Founder of Connexus Group Remax Hallmark. Consecutive Diamond Award winner. Top 30 teams around Remax Hallmark. A brave man. And he is a cancer survivor. Ravi, welcome to More Than A Sale. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for having me today. 18 years, wow. Yeah, you know what? It was a calling of mine that empowered me to create my own path and really just very mindful of the grace and the blessings that I've had and we're just getting started. May all experience joy and happiness and maybe may all my efforts contribute to that joy and happiness. And that's a life well lived to me. Ravi, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for a while now and you and I have shared many conversations and uh, you're a very philosophical person. I get a chance to learn a lot from you. You're a very inexperienced individual. You've been licensed for 18 years now as well. What's the journey been like in real estate? 18 years, wow. Yeah, you know what? I really fell in love with this industry when I started. I feel like it was really beautiful timing. It was a calling of mine that empowered me to create my own path. Um, real estate has been challenge and triumph. Thankful that I've been able to have great mentors along the way. I've been able to build a great team along the way. Uh, you know what? Enjoying this time in my life and really just very mindful of the grace and the blessings that I've had along with the hard work that's allowed me to get to this point. Um, and we're just getting started. I want to ask you a lot about your business because you've been driving things forward head on. What makes you a great team leader or what are some of the things that you've learned along the way that drive a successful team? So it's really interesting. There's so many different ways that people solve the problem of volume and solve the problem of scale and solve the problem of growing a team perhaps. And for me, my philosophy is I'm trying to create top producers. I'm trying to find a way to empower greatness amongst the people that are within my fold. And for me, that starts with a philosophy of servant leadership. What I mean by that is when I wake up in the morning, the first people that are on my mind are the shareholders in my company, which I consider my wife and my kids. Following that are the people who are vested into uh, my success and theirs mutually, which is my team. And there's no I in team, that's such a corny cliche thing to say. But I'd argue that any successful team is really good at passing. And for me, I look at the, the game of real estate or the business of real estate and say, how can I create opportunities? How can I be the leading person on assists on my team? I met Magic Johnson last week and he was, you know, one of the greatest point guards ever. He was known for the no look pass. He was known for creating opportunities for Kareem to score, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, I look at that and say, okay, whether it's Justin or Ashley or Sabrina or the Tang brothers or anybody on my team, how can I create opportunities for them to score? That's my job as a team leader. And when you're interviewing them, and when I'm sure you may, may get approached a lot, hey, Ravi, I'd like to join your team. You seem to be doing really well. What's your filtration process and what's your guideline for what will be a great team member for Ravi's? I think the first thing is reverse engineering that question and saying, will I be a great mentor for this team member? Will I create an opportunity where their success uh, is guaranteed on my team? And that comes down to number one, an understanding of what they bring to the table. And number two, an understanding of whether or not I can take them to where they need to be. I'm trying to create an environment where there's longevity, there's stickiness, because I'm just creating the best platform for anybody to possibly catapult their business. And it's really interesting because my team is centered around almost like a underlying subculture um, w coupled with an incredible business ethic and work ethic. So what I mean by that is like everybody on my team, we focus on a demographic of buyers and sellers that I try to fit the team into. So we have this online avatar or we have this customer avatar. We call them approachable ballers. And our ideal, you know, buyer seller might 
be on their second home, looking to move up, looking to buy their first investment uh, in the stage of life where maybe they're qualified professionally, but maybe they have a really cool sneaker collection. Maybe they'd like to sit courtside for the Raptors. Uh, you know, they take family vacations and, you know, have uh, are interested in like where the new restaurants are opening. And, you know, just this kind of this culture beyond the, where they live or how much they make. Are we trying to track this approachable ball or someone who feeds maybe at the soup kitchen or, you know, what we're doing our, our charity events, want to come and help out. And we're trying to find that and also match that on the demographic of who's on the team. Like, for example, this might sound really silly, but if you can't uh, sing along to a 90s hip hop song, <laughs> like you might not be the right person to be, be on my team, despite incredibly talented as a realtor. Yeah. Right. And it's not just a quantitative thing. It's, it's a qualitative thing. And it's a journey of who as much as why as much as it is what. We had the pleasure of having you uh, be one of our speakers at our event, the kickoff event this year that we had at Remax Millennium. You were one of my favorite speakers because when you speak, and I've said this to you personally before as well, every time I hear you speak, and the first time I saw you speak on stage was at the Richard Robbins event, and that was the first time I heard about you. I said, who's this guy? And you have a very unique style to how you do your presentations and then your relatability and your connectivity. You do an incredible job. You've had a tumultuous life. You've had a illustrious life. You've had a lot of ups and downs personally and professionally. And while we get into the business side of things, of, of, of all the great things you've accomplished, I want to touch upon, you know, a little bit about uh, before you got into real estate, what were you doing for our audience members and our listeners? It's really interesting. Um, I'm trained as a classical Indian musician. Let me backtrack for a second. When I was 12, uh, my dad was really into music. He was a banker. Unlike a lot of, you know, Indian or West Indian parents, yeah. music's a hobby, but he was really into music. So much so that the famous sitarist Ravi Shankar, that's one of the ways that I was given my name. When I was 12, I met my music teacher, Pandit Sharda Sahai. He's this, he's the fifth generation descendant of the founder of the Banaras Baj or the Banaras Karana, which is this, you said illustrious, like this illustrious royalty of like traditional Indian classical music and Guruji, he really took a liking to me and we had this great relationship. And uh, at the same time, he was coming every year to teach at University of Toronto. And when he was teaching at U of T, um, it was all these like Western musicians who wanted to learn a little bit of tabla and then it was me. So like these guys were like, you know, anything from symphonic conductors to like electronic musicians to like, you know, um, uh, uh, heavy metal uh, percussionist. Like, it was just a, this cross-section. When I was 12, I was taking the TTC. At that time, we lived in Mississauga. So I was taking the Mississauga Transit and the TTC, and I would go down to U of T. I walked this path called Philosopher's Walk, and I was hanging out with all these really eclectic musicians and this traditional uh, person from centuries past. And I learned so much from this experience. Uh, imagine like, you know, you're putting on your headphones, you're walking around downtown Toronto. I don't know if I'd let my kids do that now, but you know, you get to this philosopher's walk, you show up, you're in the basement of uh, St. George campus, music hall, and you're playing with all these cool people. And then you have this mentor who's literally as traditional as it gets, but in his tradition, he understood that he was an ambassador and bringing this forward. This was a backdrop for me learning more than just music. I remember one time Guruji, he said to me, you know, when I'm gone, practice will be your teacher. And whatever you practice, you can learn to become better at and eventually attain mastery of. And he had this saying, and I don't speak Hindi, but the saying was, ek sabe subsaje, subsaje subjaye, which basically means he who masters one learns to master all. And in doing these rudimentary, you know, uh, tabla exercises, I was learning to focus. I was learning to put down the video games or stop watching TV and literally focus in on just this meditative practice that gave me this perspective, gave me this sort of discipline that I'm very grateful for. So then when I'm 18, I get a scholarship to go live with him in London, England, in this neighborhood called South Hall, uh, Ealing Square. And I spent about three months 
under his like full watch. When I say full watch at 4 a.m. we'd wake up. There was no conversation. We'd just hit the tablas and we'd four to six. We were accomplishing more than what some people would accomplish in a whole day. And then, you know, people would be traveling and coming in. And there's this famous artist from Banaras. Her name's Girja Devi. She came over and, you know, Rajan Sajan, Mishra, they came over. And it was just this incredible meeting place that I was around all the time. And, you know, Guruji, he had these little isms, right? And uh, he'd say things like, you know, when you're doing the best, if the apple tree bears the largest fruit, it has to humbly bend its branches because if it stands too proud, all the fruit falls to the ground and rots. And he would say these things just out of nowhere. He'd be like brushing his teeth and he'd come over and he'd look at me and say these things. And, you know, I really learned a lot about myself, about, you know, my roots, about art. He used to say, you know, after you learn all the technical stuff, only then can you make art. Right, so there was all this like stuff happening, right? Where is he? Where is he now? Uh, he passed, but I'm I'm on Zoom with his son. Yeah, and actually, COVID was great because it connected us. We 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 have great exchanges, and you know, Sanju Sahai, who's my guru's son, he's like just exploding. He's wow. probably like mid fifties, and he's like in the top tier of classical musicians now playing all the festivals, like going on tour. And he's actually, I'm going to meet him for the first time in August wow. in Miami. So I'm very excited. I love Miami. Yeah. I actually got a scholarship to go to Miami too. Thank you, Ontario Arts Council. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're going to Miami and that'll be a bit of a homecoming. So why didn't you pursue this full time? I mean, you have such a passion for it. You get yeah. scholarships, you're, you're, you know, right in the professional uh, realm. Why, why not continue it? So, I had a bit of like a, a awakening, right? And a, sort of like this crossroads where I was feeling very conflicted because I was really stepping into a point in my life where I had to say, okay, well, where, where am I going to go with this? And, uh, you know, I was playing all kinds of strange things, Ron. Like I used to play this, this restaurant gig on King Street across from Roy Thompson Hall every Friday. And then and like, would you get paid for these? Games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what does someone get paid for something like not that? Not much. You know, maybe like five, six hundred bucks here okay, and there. Okay, cool. At that time, okay, cool. Yeah, you know, and then like I'd play for like a film festival opening or, you know, i get booked for like a house concert. But I wasn't like at that next level up. Got it. Right? And uh, I decided that my art was going to be something for me. Uh, and it would always be a part of me. But my profession would have to satisfy me on all levels, including monetary, right? And I just, I decided that I wasn't going to become professional because I didn't want to be a full-time teacher uh, doing these, you know, gigs here and there playing tabla, but I still have a great place for it. And yeah. it's a great place where, you know, I was away. I traveled to Ottawa last week. And when I got back, the first thing I wanted to do was just come play for a half an hour, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's still part of me, but it's just yeah. I've seen you. I've seen you do this interesting thing, and I and I picked it up at the kickoff event when you're really inquisitive and and you're really listening on someone. You start uh, you know doing strumming. This, yeah. You start strumming, and, yeah. and and you have rhythms going, and and you start strumming. And I've seen you do it a few times now. Yeah. And uh, and I was like, okay, cool, interesting. Like I guess this is his creative spark of. And anybody who plays any type of drums, you'll see them just kind of like their hands will just kind of be moving, and there's something happening that you don't hear that they hear. While, uh, while this whole, you know, conversation's happening. Now the journey of real estate. But I want to tell yeah, you please. one more thing mm -hmm. about sort of the becoming. So at the same time, when I was 20 years old, uh, Toronto nightlife scene was in its absolute heyday. And... Um, what year are we talking? What year we're talking that? 2000. Okay. Right? And uh, at that time, Richmond Street, which is all condos, yeah. we had more dance floor per capita than anywhere in the world. Wow. And at that time, like it started pretty much at a club called Money and went all the way to a club called Tonic. This was like mm, the best place to be when you were 21 and going out. And I happened to be um, pretty senior and pretty looped in and pretty connected in the nightlife industry. We had a company, it was called Brighter Days Entertainment, Brighter Days or BDE. 
And up to now, like people will still say, like Rav, like you guys were the legends, you guys were the OGs, you guys, you know, you did it all. Yeah. And at that time, circa 22, 23, 24, 25, we were like, I was partying a lot, but we had residencies or nights, um, three nights a week, and and then long weekend Sundays too. So you know, at my peak. That was a very lucrative business. I don't think there's a lot of money in it now because there's a lot of quote unquote hosts and social media has yeah. really changed the ability to promote. It was all about, it was network marketing at its most, you know? Buddy. Yeah. Like we used to have call centers. We yeah. were doing outbound call. We had mail drop. We right. had stamped envelopes mail drop to our VIP list. And at that time, think about this. If you wanted to meet this girl and or you wanted to see where these you know guys were going to be or these girls were going to be you didn't know nobody posted where they were eating they didn't take pictures of what restaurant they were at they didn't say where they're going to be yeah so you had to kind of show up and hope that you would kind of be in the right room at the right time yeah and we were the catalyst to that right and there, there's no cell phone numbers either you have to remember the the landline numbers you know or the pager if the or the cell phone if the girl gives you the number you know you gotta you gotta memorize it you know so, what yeah. that was that was that was a time yeah. where you know there was no online dating yeah right you had to go out and you had to have some game you had to have some skill yeah, right yeah. we had a lot of fun yeah and that was really interesting so when I was getting my license, which was 25, uh, my very first deal, I was sitting in the sort of like lounge area of a club called District in the basement. Yeah. And at this time I was a little sick and a friend of mine came up to me, drunk, like he was like two shades to the wind, comes up to me, he's like, yo, Rav, so like, what are you doing, man? Like, I heard you left IBM. I was also working at IBM. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting my real estate license. And he says, what do you mean? Like, when are you getting your real estate license? I'm like, oh, pretty soon. Like, I'm writing my last test tomorrow. He's like, well, when can you show me some homes? And I'm like, uh, how about Monday? I didn't know much, right? Yeah, but yeah. I knew to take an opportunity. And, uh, you know, for, I wrote this blog back in 2008. It was called From Clubs to Condos. And the city kind of grew up with my business. And it was really interesting because you'd take any of those clubs, they're now condos, right? So Tonic is uh, 187 Peter, Joker, which was like our camp on long weekend Sundays. Well, Money Studio on Richmond, Joker's the one with the berries downstairs. I can't remember the name okay. of the condo, but that whole area and my business kind of transferred from clubs to condos, right? Yeah. So I had this Orthodox Indian classical music background. I had this nightlife empire that we literally had shout out to like zark or bna but like we were really like we were right there mystery like the, like we control the block and then the perfect storm of all my database starting to buy homes and me being the one person they knew in real estate now everybody knows like 12 right yeah that's really interesting because hospitality if you learn it well lends itself well to a, a business in real estate but when i say learn it well i mean you know there's this book i'm reading by peter uh, guido it's called unreasonable hospitality it's like how are you making people feel how are you impacting positive change in someone's life not what are you selling them it's more than a sale right how are you creating a dynamic where they feel unwavering loyalty and advocacy for your business, right? And I, I've learned to bring that into my business. And then not just that, but it just so happens everybody on my team happens to have had a hospitality background. Yeah. Justin used to be a server. He used to work at the Jays games. He used to work at uh, Baton Rouge. Ashley, she was like a super successful bartender. Nelly, she was in service with ink for 17 years you know um uh, uh sabrina she used to be at um all stars like we all have a bit of this hospitality background and it's really interesting because i think there's something to it i think there's a lot of attrition a lot of failure but i think if you approach it with some of those skills and you understand that you're moving beyond that into a new profession but you're taking some of those key core um personal skills interpersonal skills there's something there. So, so unfortunately, our business is commission-based and a lot of agents focus on the outcome. Stop. Just stop. 
focus on the person. Focus on the service, right? The minute you can show keen interest, you know, you mentioned relatability and you said sometimes when you speak, Ravi, you have some re relatability and, and you seem to resonate with people. It's because I have, I have nothing but the best interest for that person. I'm not interested in the sale. I'm not interested in the transaction. I'm interested in the story, right? And I think that that makes a difference when it comes to uh, why people come to me, why people come to Connexus Group. And I think it also makes a difference in terms of what ladder we're trying to climb. Anybody can make money, right? Like go sell Bitcoin, wh whatever, right? Yeah. But if you really want to impact change, I think people identify that and they see that and they start to gravitate towards it. So relatability is one of them. What would you say are a couple of other interpersonal skills? I don't know what the word is, but a keen interest in the other person, right? I think that the ability to listen is better than the ability to talk. Um, and I think that, you know, the professional acumen has to be coupled with that. You could be the nicest person in the world, but if you can't sell and negotiate and market, yeah. go home. Yeah. Don't come into this arena because there's really good realtors out there, right? I think also... Um, if you're looking, there's something sort of charismatic or sparkish about the people who are at the top, right? Like, have you ever met somebody and you, after you talk to them, you feel more energized? Yeah. You're like, wow, like I just had this great conversation. Like, I feel like I want to go run, right? And then you talk to other people. It's like, wow, I just talked to this person. I'm really <laughs> tired, yeah. you know? And yeah. I think that you got to carry that energy with you. Yeah. And also carry that energy and then maintain it amidst all the bullshit. How do you maintain that energy for yourself? Because I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. And, and because it's, I find in our industry, when you're a team leader, when you're a broker, you are giving back, but the giving back is coming from the energy that you're giving to each person because it's a matter of influence. Yeah. Whether it's a good day, whether it's a bad day, that energy is gonna be transferred. Uh, transferred. Yeah. So how do you channel that energy for yourself when you're not having the greatest of the days and there's a lot of BS happening in your life and challenges that you're experiencing? How do you go about it? What's your process? So I'm gonna say something that might sound super corny, Ron. I choose that every day is a good day. You know, without getting into all the specifics of my health, I we, we may stop on that. But, like, I literally won the fucking lottery. Like, I'm alive. And I, I mean that, right? Like, there was a likelihood that you and I would not be doing this right now. So when you have the perspective of gratitude, you have superpowers. And I, it's the, my wife will laugh because she's like, nothing gets Rav upset. Like Rav is just always happy. You know, Sabrina on my team, so she'd be like, you know, like you could have a bad day. Like you don't always have to be cheerful and joyful, but I reject that. I honestly believe that you can look to 5 billion people on this world or probably more. I realize they've all got it worse than us. And you know, that perspective, I mean, Gaza, the hospital, Alzheimer's, cancer, like these things are bad. Traffic's not bad. Someone being difficult client is not bad. Lean into that. Find the reason to say, hey, you know what? This is something I get to do and I'm happy. I drove here, I didn't take the 407, I took the 401. I'm like, ah, traffic's gonna be a little steep. I'm like, that's okay. Let me put on a playlist, right? Like, I don't, I reject this idea that there is something to complain about when literally 5 billion plus people in the world have it worse than us. You mentioned your help. I've heard the story when I was listening to you speak and, I, and, and interestingly enough, I've met you so many times, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you took me way back, you know? You, you, you took me away and I was just listening, I was listening, I was like, man, I need to be like Ravi you know, have that attitude on life because he almost didn't have it. Yeah, yeah. So um, for anyone who's listening and not familiar with my story, when I was uh, graduating university, I had ended up getting a very, 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 very aggressive case of something called ulcerative colitis. And at that point, I had shrunk down to 103 pounds. Uh, I'm 203 pounds now. Uh, for, um, what what is that specifically for for those of you that don't know? Yeah, that so it's basically an attack of your gut health, Got in it. particular the colon. Got it. All right. It would have been summer of two thousand and six, 
I remember going into the doctor's office and the doctor saying to me that I'm a high candidate for colon cancer by the age of 35. Uh, furthermore, it would be unwise for him to say that I will live to 40. But at the time, there was this curative procedure, highly invasive surgery, that if I went through, um, fingers crossed, it should get rid of the colon, thus get rid of the colitis. I would wear something called an ostomy bag, which is basically a hole on your on your tummy where that's how you get rid of your waste. And if all the, you know, stuff in the first operation works well, the second operation would actually reroute that and I'd live a life with normal sort of, um, you know, bowel movements, etc. We decided that I would have this operation and on November 2nd, 2006, October 31st was my Halloween party because I was throwing parties at the time. And on November 2nd, 2006, I went in for this surgery and I was admitted to Mount Sinai. I was a very dark time in my life. A um, lot of complications, a lot of challenges. The third day after the operation, um, they put something called an NG tube into my nose and they were, you know, sucking out everything through this machine. And uh, that day was the darkest day of my life. And I'm going to tell you something, Ron. I don't think you know this, but um, that day I, I, <laughs> I lied there and I was awake and I was extremely, extremely distraught. And I was literally make it or not make it kind of vibe that night. And something happened. And um, I started saying this traditional Hindu mantra. Yeah. I said, I kept saying this thing called the Mahamrityur Mantra. And I don't even know why I was saying it. I actually didn't know what I was saying. But I just kept saying it over and over and over and over and over again. And um, the only way I can explain this feeling was I felt like this grace. I felt like this divinity. I felt like this comfort. I felt like something, somebody was just hugging me or like putting their hand. Actually, I felt it on, on my neck, putting their hand on my neck. And I truly feel like I, my life was saved that night. Coincidentally, years later, I told this story to somebody in Rochester. I was playing a concert in Rochester and the guy looked at me. He says, what were you saying? I said, I was saying the Muhammad, your mantra. He's like, you know what that is? I'm like, no. This is years later. He says, that's a mantra to ward off death. And I said, oh, wow. Well, I said, that, well, that made sense. Wow. So, Ron, when you have stuff like that happen, and you go through that, and you come out on the other side, and you have a nice job, and you have a great family, and you have a beautiful wife, and you drive your dream car, and you're building abundantly, like, really and truly, my perspective is my uh, superpower. Like, I'm just here, happy, because that's how dark it was, right? I have a couple of questions for you. So you have the last party, and obviously when you're sitting down with your family, you, were you married at the time? Uh, when I had this uh, operation? Yeah. No, I was dating a girl, and we're married now. Okay, cool. And she really, really, really looked after me okay she put in the work you know that's amazing god bless her and uh, that's the one you know that's that's how you that's how <laughs> you know it's the one. one you have a conversation with your family who who, who was mm. your big support pillars at that period oh, of time very very grateful for my parents mm. uh, very grateful for angela very grateful for all the people that were surrounding me at the time the last person I saw before I got wheeled into this operating room that looked like a spaceship, like I remember like just looking around and being like, this place is crazy, uh, was my dad. And, you know, he said, it's just you and your surgeon and your maker now, and I love you. I think maybe twice in my life he's ever said that. Because he's like a tough dad, right? Or was a tough dad. Not like a, not like a lovey-dovey guy at all, right? Like if you did really good, maybe he'd just go, huh? Right? Like, just tough, right? And uh, you know what? Like, that was, uh, like, I'm I no shortage of beautiful mentors in my life. And, uh, you know, my dad was in real estate. He took a couple hard blows in 89. 
Um, at the time, he left the bank and owned a company with the Walton brothers and, you know, was developing Heartland and Bramley and all of that. Oh, wow. Um, John John Sr. And, and David Sr. Waltons, they owned a company called United Lands, and they were in land services. My dad would wake me up, put on the music, and we'd go drive to this farm, and he'd pull me out. I was 10. He'd say, see this? We're servicing this land here. His McCallion wants to build a school here. And there's a company called Green Park. They're going to take this block. There's a company called Madami. They're going to take this block. Like, I was getting groomed for this. So I was 10 years old. Yeah. Right? I remember, like, sometimes he'd take me for walks. And, you know, like, I'd be like, just, I just want to want to go play Super Mario Brothers or something. But we were doing some deep stuff. Yeah. Right? So when you ask about who I had, like, you know, I have no shortage of po positive influences in my life, uh, none the least of which would be my mom and dad, and obviously the support elsewhere, right? And I think, you know, like my ancestors left India against very tough odds and crushed it in Guyana. And my parents left Guyana under very tough circumstances and crushed it here. And that's also like something for me. It's like, okay, like with all the stuff that my quote unquote ancestors have done, who am I not to take it one step further? You know, and I hope that I build that into my kids too. If you were to tell, knowing what you know now and how you feel and how you are, that boy on the wheelchair that's going in for surgery and you were to tell him something, what would you tell him? <laughs> oh my God, that's a deep one, guy. Let me think about this for like two seconds. I mean, um, probably in math, positive is always greater than negative. And that's true for life too, right? Like the actual equation plus greater than minus is just logical. Yeah. You know, so just keep that with you, right? Um, if I'm going to expand on that, like take care of your body, right? I think that's super important. I think that's understated for people in our profession with the understanding that a lot of realtors are listening to this, perhaps like the shots at the bar and the coffee on the go and the, you know, the, the quick bite from the, the drive through while you're on your way to showings. Yeah. Probably not the best way to live, you know, yeah. take care of your body. And then uh, practice gratitude. You know, I think like, I, I don't want to sound like I'm repetitive, but the reality is like, it's literally my superpower. If I could say one thing, just practice gratitude and learn how to practice it. Like I learned it the very hard way, but maybe there's other ways that you can put it into your daily practice. And I agree with you because I also feel the same way about practicing gratitude. I've also learned along the way now that it's so important to learn how to manage stress. Stress mm -hmm. will always be inevitable and it comes in many different ways. And it, it's interesting to see how you define stress and what your approach to stress is, what you may find difficult now or stressful now when you talk to somebody else. Like, what are you talking about? This, it's, not a, it's not a big deal. You're overreacting or you're, you know, because at that point in time, you may feel a certain type of way. Yeah. So what I want to ask you is, in a chaotic world of real estate, mm -hmm. for all our listeners that are running around, either a, running a team, that are doing showing to showing, working with a lot of clients or leads or what are the most important actionable steps that agents can take or should be taking to have a organized career? Yeah. So I'm on a upwards journey on this and we're all learning as we go. Yeah. But there was a course I took with some of my boys, shout out to Ralph Ciancio from um, Markham Unionville, but he organized us to take this course called Insane Productivity by Darren Hardy. And one of the things in Darren Hardy's course that I love, and I've used this ever since, is the shelving technique. And I think all realtors should do this. So shelving technique is basically work on something, and then when you're not working on it, put it on the shelf. So I don't answer my phone. I return calls. When someone calls me, I say, hey, are you available at 1130? Or are you available at 12? Are you available at two? Like I have calls booked for the drive home, two, two thirty, three. I have calls booked. Most realtors, they're reactive instead of planned out and instead of calendarized. And you know, 
like I'll have an offer. Now, an offer comes in on a property. A lot of realtors will get excited, call their client. I'll take the offer and I'll say, hey, have an offer. Are you free at 5 p.m.? Let's discuss in, 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 in detail. But I'll send out an email first saying, this is the offer. These are the items. This is my recommendation. This is what we're going to encounter. Then the email, then the phone call is just, hey, did you get my email? Any questions? Right? There's systems to doing all of this, right? I think the other thing about shelving is we have this new experiment that we're all got. Social media, right? And it's like, here we are recording video and a podcast, but we're addicted. And by the way, it's very scary to see what 10-year-old girls on TikTok are addicted to. It's legitimately uh, addiction to the endorphine release. So we have to learn how to package that and compartmentalize it. And that's probably our biggest... It used to be the cell phone, but now it's literally what the cell phone or the smartphone does, right? So I would say shelf everything. Now, the second thing is we all know that there's five things that we should do that we say we'll do and we'll get to that sometimes we don't. Drink water, exercise, attach yourself to nature, read, and meditate. And if you do those, you can manage a much bigger stress load, right? And by the way, the bigger the stress load, the more general success you can get in real estate, right? So you have to do those at some point. What are some governing principles that you have created for your life to create that safe space for your business to thrive, for you to invest time with your family, yeah. and for you to get your personal time? How do you how do you go about that? So it's interesting. I'd say about three years ago, I maybe during actually the pandemic. The pandemic was a critical time, and it was a time... I feel like pain is a great teacher, right? I did not have the option of not being a full-time parent and managing the stress of my household. So my business had to get compartmentalized. And I'm no longer busy, Ron. Before, we'd be busy. And generally speaking, busy is a bad word for a business person. Now I'm purposeful. And the way you change that is how you address whatever's happening, right? No drama, compartmentalized, put into the calendar. These are things that allow you to succeed. If you're reactive, if you're dwelling in drama, if something happens, therefore you're doing something, you're not going to succeed. And by the way, my clients are never looking for me. I want to explain that. If my clients are looking for me, I have failed. Because the first thing I do after I check in with my family with my team is I run through my entire pipeline of nurture and transact. If I have a listing on the market and they're reaching out to me for an update, I've made a mistake because every day a quick email goes out with, this is what we've done. This is what I expect. This is what's going to happen next. I'll keep you posted. My clients are the most cared for because they know Rabbi's got it, but it's all purposeful. And you're doing this yourself and yeah. Yeah. You know, I carry it. It's a seller's market, again, thankfully, right? I carry, you know, two or three listings at most at any time, right? right? We tee them up, we get them sold, and then we get the next one going, right? The prep story sometimes is longer than the uh, uh, listing story, right? But it's literally, it's, it's a machine right now, and it's continually getting tweaked. What's next for you? That is changing right now. Just so happens that uh, pain has come back in the form of another health threat. Mm. And I'm addressing this. I, uh, you and I, we haven't talked about this, but it's allowing me to step into more. So it's really interesting. Ron, if, if I told you this right now and I said, let's just say you got 14 years. And I'm not saying that's my situation, but let's just say yeah. that, you know what? Time is not infinite. You got 14 years. What are you going to do? You do more shit, right? You do epic shit, right? You don't say things like, I should do something. You just go out and you make the best, right? For me, my priority is obviously raising my family. My second priority is growing a team. And I'm willing to create a place, a space for more talent slowly. Um, I really love my team members. I love all of them. I love what we've created and I'm a little, I've been a little bit of a gatekeeper, meaning I don't want to let more people into that, but I'm opening that up a little. 
I'm saying, hey, you know what? Right now we got seven agents. If there's something I can give and share and build with other people, I'm willing to go to 10. I'm willing to go to 12, but I'm doing it slow, right? I have a bucket list item and I'll just tell you. So I've kind of, I talked to my buddy Braden in BC. He's another broker owner with Remax. And um, we both said we we're going to work on writing a book. And my book's called Letters to DJ. So Letters to DJ, my son is eight years old. His name is Dylan Joseph. Okay. All right. DJ is like very, very, very like strong-willed, right? So I want to write a collection of short letters about everything and anything. Like just stuff you would tell like your guy, you know, yeah. as he's 13, as he's 18, as he's 25, as he's 40, right? Collection of kind of like anecdotal letters with the thought that when this gets published, as I do more speaking engagements and kind of connect on amplifying my voice, this would be something that when sold, the proceeds go to Canadian Cancer Society or something thereabouts, right? So that's my big bucket item. And, I love uh, that. I, I really, working I on really, it. I really love that idea. My daughter is going to be like, well, what the fuck, dad? Like, why is it letters <laughs> to DJ? Like, who am I? You yeah, know, yeah. might have to get her a dog or something, right? But that's kind of like the bucket item. Chatting with you, this time just flies by so fast. <laughs> and so engrossed, engrossed in your conversation because I, I want to learn more. I want to hear more. And, and you have that personality. And I've always been a big fan of yours. And I told you this as well because you you have such an engaging personality where I want to know about every little bit of thing in your life because you use a lot of philosophical terms and uh, philosophical terms. And uh, I, I That's learned good you from got that. it out. Yeah, I got it philosophical out. Philosophical terms. I, there you go. I want to finish this podcast off with an important question. It's a loaded one as well. And that's, who is Ravi Singh? I'm going to say it like this. Ravi Singh is someone who loves life and loves learning and loves growth and loves giving. That's really everything for me. I have a Sanskrit mantra on my forearm, a uh, tattoo, and it says, Loka Samastu Sukhino Bhavantu, which basically means may all experience joy and happiness and may, be, may all my efforts contribute to that joy and happiness. And that's a life well lived to me. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing your story yeah, and your journey, Ravi. You. I appreciate you. Ladies and gentlemen, another special episode. I truly enjoyed. Meaning, meaningful one for me. Stay tuned for the next podcast.